You're listening to the Mind Over Finger podcast, episode number 13. Welcome to the Mind Over Finger podcast, discussions on mindful music making, efficient practice, and building a purposeful career. And now, your host, Dr. Renee Paul Gauthier. Hi, everyone. Today I speak with composer Jim Stevenson. I'm really excited to have Jim on because I love both his music and his story. After discovering him a couple years ago, I went to his website and found a wealth of incredible repertoire and have been a big fan ever since. I was even more intrigued when I met him and heard about his journey in becoming a composer. I was very inspired because his story truly is a testament of the incredible things that can happen when one follows a calling and takes a leap of faith forward. Jim's music has been performed by leading American orchestras, instrumentalists, and wind ensembles around the world, and it has received both critical acclaim and audiences' praises. Jim came late to his full-time composing career, having performed 17 seasons as a trumpet player in the Naples Philharmonic. As such, he is largely self-taught, making his voice truly individual and his life's work all the more remarkable. Recent and upcoming premieres include the St. Louis and Chicago Symphony, Minnesota Orchestra, and Cabrillo Festival, as well as the U.S. President's own Marine Band. Over 150 orchestras and bands play his music annually. Not only that, but Jim graciously agreed to let me use his Concerto No. 1 for Trumpet and Chamber Orchestra as the Mind Over Finger podcast musical theme. So his music has been greeting you at the beginning and end of each episode of the podcast. Today, among many other topics, we discuss his transition from performer to full-time composer, why it's important to look inside and listen to our instinct, why we need to have the right mindset in building a career we love, and how to harness focus in our work. I strongly recommend that, when you're done listening to the episode, of course, you visit Jim's website at composerjim.com where you can learn more about him, take a look at his impressive discography, listen to his amazing works, and look at their scores. Jim's story and approach to following a path is highly inspirational, and I know you'll love this discussion. I also have two very special guests following my conversation with Jim, so stay tuned. Let's go to the show. Jim Stevenson, I'm so happy to have you on the show. Thank you, Renee. It's really, really great to be here. I appreciate this. First of all, I want to thank you for accepting to have your trumpet concerto as the theme song for the Mind Over Finger podcast. Something about it made me so happy, and I felt like I identified with it in a meaningful way. And I was so thrilled when you gave me the green light and sent me the file. I'm glad you chose to use it. I mean, that concerto uh, requires a lot of mind over fingers because it's very difficult. So I think it's apropos. (laughs) That's great. Jim, I was first introduced to you and your music by Holly Mulcahy, the guest on episode four of the podcast. And she was performing your violin concerto with the Chattanooga Symphony. And she built such a great anticipation online about this piece. It got me really curious about you and your music. And then a few months later, I had the opportunity to perform the same concerto with the Elgin Symphony and Jennifer Frouchy, for whom the piece was written, I believe. Correct? Correct. Yes. And I absolutely fell in love with your music. And I think one of the reasons people and musicians like your music so much is because, as I saw on your website, you say that you have this endeavor to be a performer's composer and always remaining sensitive to the needs of those who are on stage making the music happen. And and we feel it. And your music is indeed so much fun to perform. I appreciate that. That means a lot because it, um, yeah, I mean, I spent 17 years in an orchestra myself and was a trumpet player as a kid. And so I do know exactly what it's like to be on stage. And I do know what it's like to have music put in front of you that is um, either just ridiculously difficult or, or not fun or 
you know, you question why it's even there. So I, you know, I'm sure I still make mistakes and I will continue to, but I, I do want people to enjoy playing my music uh, as much as possible. Mm, and we do. And I'm so happy to have you on the show because in addition to being a big fan of your music, I became really, really impressed with you as a person when we met after that performance with the Elgin Symphony. And your story and the way you shaped your career made a really strong impression on me. And I'd love for the listeners to hear about your musical journey in your own words. So can you please tell us about you, how you got to where you are today and how your artistic path has unfolded? Sure. I hope you have a little bit of time. Um, so, all the time, all the time. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I tell people this all the time. I mean, I even told it to a, a young orchestra I've been conducting lately. I told them this yesterday. Uh, I can't even believe I, I'm still shocked that I'm either uh, yesterday standing in front of them as a conductor or even today talking to you in the role of a composer, because uh, as I sort of hinted at just a little while ago, my ultimate goal from the age of 10, I, I think, maybe maybe 13 when we start really thinking about these things, but my ultimate goal was to be, uh, to put it bluntly, the first, the principal trumpet of the Chicago Symphony. That's what I wanted to be, uh, starting as a very young kid. I think uh, you recently interviewed Paul Markello, and he and I were young trumpet players together uh, in the Chicago area, and we would get together on a, well, whenever possible, and just play trumpet excerpts and talk about the great recordings of the Chicago Symphony and other trumpet players, Maurice Andre, and we would try to be these people, and he's gone on to succeed. Uh, however, I don't play trumpet anymore. <laughs> and so the story is that um, things seem to be headed in that direction for me um, early on. I, I went to Interlochen as a high school kid. I went to the New England Conservatory um, as a trumpet performance major. And I was one of the very lucky ones in that, uh, I still don't know how it happened, but two weeks before I graduated, I got a job in an orchestra. And so uh, this was the Naples Philharmonic down in Florida. And um, I thought, okay, here I go, I'm on my way. I, I've got my job, I'm 21, I'm gonna stay here five years. Uh, I'll move on to the next orchestra and then maybe the next one. And then hopefully someday that Chicago symphony dream will come true. Um, however, a funny thing happened on the way to the, <laughs> it, 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 uh, it never, it didn't work out that way. Um, at least as far as Trump is, is concerned. I started arranging music simply because we needed it. I was, uh, in a brass quintet that did a lot of educational shows. Uh, we'd go to schools, 25 schools a year down in Naples, Florida, and demonstrate our instruments. You, you know how that goes. We would, I'd mm -hmm. say, here's a trumpet. Here's a trumpet. I can play high and fast. And the tuba player would say, I'm a tuba player. I play the low notes. And Anyway, um, after a while, you get sick of doing the same old demonstrations over and over and over again. And so somebody said, we should arrange something fun for these kids to play. And, and uh I, for whatever reason, I don't know why. Um, I guess I do know why. Maybe we'll get to that. But I raised my hand and I said, I'll do it. I'll arrange it. And so I arranged some songs for us to play and we played them and the kids enjoyed it. And, and um, But more uh, importantly for me is my colleagues enjoyed playing them, or at least they told me they did. And so that little, that little pat on the back got me to uh, arrange more and more. I started arranging for our orchestra. We had a... Um, a very famous pops conductor who has now passed away. Uh, his name was Eric Kunzel. And I started arranging for him and he started taking my arrangements all around the world and recording them with the Cincinnati pops and um, playing them with, you know, Chicago symphony and Boston pops and all these wonderful orchestras. And so this was suddenly getting very interesting to me. And, um, I had more power than I did as a second trumpet player. Suddenly I was writing the notes for people to play and for them to express, you know, what's inside their souls and inside their hearts. And so I started uh, just making the switch to composing. I, I thought to myself, well, if I'm arranging other people's music, what would happen if I started writing my own and, and let's see how that goes. And so it really was all just a very organic, but unexpected uh, development of a composing career and uh, eventually 
the composing got so busy that, uh, knock on wood, that um, something had to give. And so at this point, my wife and I had four young children and we were both playing in the orchestra and I was doing this composing thing and uh, we just needed some space somewhere. So we quit uh, cold, not cold, not totally cold turkey. We took a year off from the Naples Philharmonic to move to Chicago to see if the composing career might have a chance. And uh, as soon as we arrived in Chicago, we knew we were here to stay. And so that's that's the beginning of uh, the rest of my second career. And now I'm, now I'm a full-time composer and trumpet is in the case. So that's, that's why I'm still shocked to be talking to you as a composer, because I never thought I'd be doing this. <laughs> oh, that's such a great story, Jim. And I think it's a story that's so important for people to hear, because, you know, of course, you worked really hard at your craft, and you are where you are today because of your dedication. But not everybody has the guts to follow their dreams, to take that leap of faith and just dive in. You know, it's so easy to just cruise and stay on the course we're on just by default. It takes courage to, you know, do it the way you did. You put your cards on the table, you quit everything, and you really gave this composition thing a go. And can you speak more to that? Can you tell us about what went in this thought process of moving forward with the idea and what emotions and trials you went through? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, or it's great for me to think about. What, what was interesting to... I, The, the light went off in my head or the bells started ringing in my head uh, when I suddenly thought of, and I just want to remind anybody who might listen that this does not have to be, you know, what anybody else has to do. We all have our own paths. But for me, when I, so I got in that orchestra when I was 21 and I was the second trumpet player. And um, when it started to hit me that, let's say I retired at the age of 65. And so that would have meant I sat in that chair for 44 years. Um, and it just hit me. I was like, is that really, if I'm to look 44 years into the future, or, or at that point, maybe it was 27 years into the future. Is that really what I want my career to be known as? Uh, sorry, that's a really poorly formed sentence, but, um, <laughs> And that, that's just when it hit me that, hey, wait a minute, maybe I have something more to say about music than what I'm currently doing. My father was an entrepreneur. He started his own business. Um, I may, So maybe that's in my blood. And I know when I started composing, I realized why when I was 11 sitting in a youth orchestra and we were playing night on bald mountain and I was really struck by the harmonies that Mazorsky used. And I thought they were so cool, so much cooler than any, any rock music I'd ever heard as, as a kid. And, and, uh, why I would cry during some classical music, uh, concerts even, and, and recordings and whatever. It's because I was just so enamored by the sounds that were being created. And so now this new found, dream or passion of trying to create those sounds that other people might hopefully enjoy that just really took hold. And so that's, I mean, every day when I sit here at my computer writing music or sitting at the piano, that's what's going on in my head is how can I try to create those sounds? So, so to get back to your question, um, everybody else thought we were stupid <laughs> or they, or they question, you know, you know, why are you leaving Florida to move to Chicago? And why are you quitting your jobs? I mean, you have two salaries. What are you thinking? I never, ever, ever thought of it that way. Not once. It was just like, all right, this is where I'm at. How can I move forward? What's the next thing I have to do to try to move forward and, and make this career happen? And that's, I mean, that's honestly, that's still something I think about uh, daily. I mean, this is not a salaried job that I have, so I have to create my own work, but um, it's a challenge I enjoy. And maybe some people enjoy that challenge and others don't. So for me, it's just something that seemed um, uh, invigorating and inspiring. You know, I'm inspired by so many things of what you're saying, but you said that, you know, we all follow our own path, but it takes so much courage to actually look inside deeply at what we truly want and go for it. And it's so easy to just follow this beaten path. So 
the fact that you had this courage to really move forward and, and give it a go is really something that I want, especially the younger generation, the people who are early in the career to hear because everything is possible, especially these days, 2018, with all the technology that we have, there are so many new avenues that are uh, available to young musicians. What would your advice be to these young musicians who might have this dream to maybe move towards a transition and, uh, you know, in, in regards to maybe what the mindsets that are necessary, you mentioned that your family has uh, some entrepreneurial uh, blood in it uh, and, you know, maybe some concrete steps that they can or maybe should take or things that they should do or avoid what are your thoughts on those things that's a lot of questions <laughs> well i mean <laughs> well i think it's just a, it's just a mind shift i mean you have to shift your thinking into so that everything you're doing everything you're about uh all your actions all your connections are about that dream that is in your head um once i became a composer um Everything I did was, you know, going to conferences or contacting people or my thought process during the day, I was now thinking about, you know, structures of a piece and whatever. It, it's you, everything you do has to be about that goal. I was, I was talking with a, uh, I, I was doing an interview with a young student yesterday at a college, actually. And um, we were talking about him. I mean, he was interviewing me, but I always like to flip the interview and talk about him. And um, so I said to him, so he's a per percussionist. And I said, you know, so close your eyes. And he did. I said, all right, it's 20 years from now. What are you doing? And he said, I, I think this even surprised him because uh, it, he had this look of um, shock on his face after this happened. But he, he said, all right, I'm on a stage. It's not a huge stage. It's, it's maybe a small recital stage. And I said, okay, what instrument are you playing? He said, well, I got a, I have a marimba. And is there anybody else playing with you? No, it's just me. And um, I said, all right, what, what music are you playing? He thought about it and he said, I'm playing video game music. And I said, all right, go do that. Don't wait, but don't wait for 20 years. Do a recital, right? plan one right now. Play video game music on your marimba invite your friends to come. I would come see what he was saying was so interesting to me. I, it, it already grabbed me and I'm just one person. I was like, I would be there. If you program that recital, I would be there tomorrow because he had such passion about what he was thinking about. I could see it in his face. And so I would just invite people to think about where they might want to be in 20 years, maybe 10 years, whatever, and then take steps that very day towards that goal. Don't expect that it's just going to happen to you. You have to define your own life. You have to create that path. And there are so many opportunities to, for people to, to do unique things and, and to create a passionate story that others latch onto. But uh, the, if you're trying to do somebody else's story, it's not going to work. But if you create your own and are committed to it, people will, people will follow it and they will become your fans. So uh, I thought that was interesting that yesterday I had that experience with him because I just saw this fire light underneath this, this, uh, maybe 20 year old kid and, uh, sorry, kid to me. Um, so I'm hoping he'll do it. I might follow up with him because it was there. And so that, that's sort of what I would recommend. I would suggest that just start now. Jim, that's great. Thanks so much for sharing this story with us. You know, I'm really convinced that it's, it's such an important message. And I know that people will be inspired by how you negotiate these turns. And I love how you say it's a mind shift and that you have to create your own story. It's so true. It's just so easy to go with the tide. And, you know, we need to narrow our focus and have our eye on what we truly want. This is really, really um, what you just said is so inspiring to me. And it's so easy to be swayed by other people's stories, right? I mean, you see somebody else having success and, and the temptation is to want to like copy what they're doing. And if you do that, it's just going to be fake and people will see right through that. You know, it has to be authentic. It has to be your story. Yes. You know, we all look different. We all look different. And so we all have to have a different story just by the fact that we all look different. So, <laughs> um, 
Like, go for it, you know, create your, create your persona, create your, but it can't be fake. You can't hype yourself. You can't say things that aren't true. You have to just stick to what you believe in your heart and uh, people will feel that. Yes, 100%. Now, um, for a little bit of a pivot to the composition part of your life, as a performer who's never composed a thing in her life, <laughs> this whole creation part is kind of a mystery to me. I, I would love to understand better what it is. So can you please talk to us a little bit about your creation process? I mean, you don't have to give away all of your magic tricks, of course, but how does music go from an idea to a final product? How does that work for you? Wow, you might have to rein me in on this one. Um, <laughs> it's, I mean, because I mean, I'm not sure I know the answer. I mean, let's, let's, not forget uh, that I'm not a quote unquote trained composer, right? I mean, I used to be embarrassed to say that, but um, I did not go through the proper channels, if you will. I didn't study composition in college. I don't have a single teacher who has ever looked at my scores and, and told me what to do. Um, my career is completely a self, uh, I don't say self-taught, I say self-learning because we never stop learning. So. Mine is just uh, always being curious and, and always just uh, seeing what happens next. But uh, so in that sense, what I'm trying to say is that my compositional process, just like when I was an 11-year-old kid see, sitting in an orchestra and my ears were tickled by the, the chords of Mussorgsky, that is what I'm always doing. I'm, I'm just using my ear to find sounds and melodies and, and rhythms and, and textures and colors that are where my own ear is tickled and, and intrigued. And, and I try to keep a, a sense of momentum throughout the music. Um, so the, the very, the very nuts and bolts of it is I will either get an idea in my head. Um, I hear something in my head and I'll, I'll, I'll write it down or sing it into my phone. So I won't forget it. Um, and it's always in a particular key. I don't have perfect pitch, but I, once I hear something, it has to be in that key. Uh, I don't switch anything based on whether somebody can play an, an A double sharp or not. Uh, <laughs> so, um, I, I, it, so it goes from just a concept into my head. And then I do a lot of thinking about the shape of the piece, the emotion of the piece. I, always imagine myself sitting in the audience sitting in the audience listening to my own piece that's like I, I i visualize myself sitting in about the 12th row and there are people all around me and i i'm actually watching the conductor seeing how he or she is responding to the music i'm looking at the musicians on stage i'm thinking about their parts whether or not they're involved um, these all go into every note i write And so it's not just me creating notes on a page and throwing it at musicians. It's like when I'm composing, I'm really, they're with me. Uh, the conductor is with me. The audience is with me. So it's a very um, image-based form of composing, I suppose. And, and once I get rolling, the, the piece kind of tells me where it needs to go. Uh, I do not... I don't compose theoretically. I don't ever say, okay, I need to get to F major, so I better hit a C7 soon so I can get there. It's never that. It's just the music flows and, okay, it needs to go here. So now I'm going to take it there and we'll see where it goes. Uh, there is some negotiating that happens uh, with form and all that with regards to that, but it's a very organic process, uh, which either starts at a piano or me sitting in the and singing into my phone or mowing the grass and I have a great idea and I run to the computer and get it down. Oh, I told you I would There's ramble. no proverbial napkin in here somewhere <laughs> in the restaurant. Oh, no. Oh, no. I've got a couple of those. Uh, let's see. Uh, I'm looking around. My desk right now is littered with scraps of paper uh, and little sketchbooks and, and things. But um, it, usually it, it, I'll sketch something and then it's it goes into the piece and I don't ever go back to the sketchbook. The, the piece then takes over and it goes where it needs to go. I'm really fascinated by how you say you have no formal composition training, yet you are so masterful at what you do right now. What kind of training did you put yourself through between 
your first um, attempts at composing and now? Yeah, that's a good question. It's um, It's been difficult, to be honest, because my schooling is sometimes the performances themselves. I was never in a college situation where I could have trial and error, you know, write something and it only stays within that school and, and a teacher says, that's terrible, you need to fix that. No, my, my lessons always come when I'm sitting in the audience and I'm having a world premiere and I get a sense of whether the players and the conductor and the audience uh, are liking it or not. So it's kind of a, it's sometimes a very painful process. Uh, I've had certainly had some failures and I, I'm sure I will continue to have failures, but, uh, you know, it's not, it's not win or lose, right? It's win or learn. So if, if something doesn't go well, that's, I see that as opportunity to really, um, fix that for next time as best as I can. So, you know, my, unfortunately my schooling comes whenever I have a world premiere and, um, which isn't every day, of course. So I go from, and not just a world premiere, it could be any performance that I'm at, of my music where I can sit and take in uh, whether or not the, the flow of the music seems to be grabbing people or not, or grabbing me most importantly. And uh, then I never go back and edit works I've already written. I just don't have time, unfortunately. So my, the next piece has to be better. The next piece has to fix problems that I'm experiencing in the, in the current piece. And do you reach out to other instrumentalists? For example, in the case of a violin concerto, because I hope the listeners go and listen to this piece. It is so wonderful. Um, how do you write for instruments that you don't play? Another good question. Um, it's Well, it all comes from my sitting in an orchestra for, well, literally since the age of 10 until I was 38. Um, I didn't in case I didn't say this, I, I wasn't a full-time composer until I was 38. So all the time before that was uh, sitting in an orchestra. And uh, boy, there is a lot of learning that goes on when you sit there and you watch and listen to your colleagues and you see them move. Uh, and, and when they enjoy music that they're playing, you can feel it. You see them moving together. You can feel it in the energy in the room. And conversely, of course, you can tell when they're bored out of their minds or hate what they're playing <laughs> or we talk about you know, we hate what we're playing. You know this, yes. right? And so, um, so maybe I'm too uh, sensitive or insecure. Or I don't know, but I, I don't want to write music that results in that with my musicians. I want them to love what they're playing. So uh, in the case of a violin concerto, for example, um, I wrote mainly uh, with what I knew from listening to a lot of violin concertos um, my wife is a violinist, so of course I hear her play all the time. Uh, I did not really consult her, uh, I have to say, when it came to writing this violin concerto, because I was just sort of in my mindset of just writing what I heard. And then um, I knew that if I wrote some things that were impossible, uh, people would let me know. So there's always that process, you know. So in the case of the violin concerto, by the way, I have two. So we're talking about the one that's called Tributes. Um, yes. It's a violin concerto. Um, so this one written for Jennifer Fauci, I sent her the music and then I always say this to my soloists. I say, look, uh, I'm not dead set stuck on any of this. If any of it's impossible, let me know. I, you're the soloist. I want you to feel comfortable. You're the one putting your, uh, life on the line up there front and center is the, not life on the line, but you understand what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Um, they're the ones in the spotlight and I want them to feel happy and comfortable with what they're playing. So uh, Jennifer sent me maybe four corrections out of a 30 minute piece. I think that's okay. <laughs> I did okay. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I had written some double stops that were just ridiculously stupid. And she just said, you know, let's, let's change that. And, and I was fine with that. That's what I want to do. Uh, same thing right now. I'm writing a bass or I just finished a bass trombone concerto and it's been a, a lot of interaction between me and the soloist to uh, get it to where he wants it. So Hmm. Very collaborative process. Yeah, this is great. And, you know, four corrections, that's not bad. I could send Paganini about 50. So hmm. Don't go compare me to Paganini. <laughs> 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 I think we know where, where, oh, yes. where I stand in that regard. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, no, I was, ha you know, I was happy that uh, I got most of it right and not right, but you know, that it was um, for the most part playable. Uh, yes, it's difficult, but um, 
everybody, everybody enjoys a challenge, right? Yeah. I think the main point, and of course this goes with performers too, is just, I think being open to the collaborative process is, um, something that people respond to. Um, if, if you, and I know there are composers and, and performers and who are very, um, stubborn in what they've created and, and they want it their way or no other way. And, and they've been successful. I'm not saying it can't be that way, but just for me, I like working with people and keeping the channels open for collaboration. Mm. That's so great, Jim. <laughs> and you know, what I love about this, it, it can be mapped onto our approach to practicing and performing. So for example, when you're talking about this visualization, I had never realized that's something that composers did, but it's, It, I love how it really is reminiscent of how we visualize performing the works. And I love what you said about you win or you learn and, and these lessons that you get in performance because it's so much of the same for us. Once you leave school, that's when the learning begins up to a certain point. You know, when you lead a life in music, there's so much to be learned when you perform and what you're talking about, this power of you know, drawing from your experience and learning by osmosis in a certain way by observing your colleagues. I find this, uh, this answer that you just gave us so inspiring. And as you know, my whole mission is centered around mindful and deliberate, efficient practice. How does that translate in the composition studio for you? How do you harness focus in the workroom while you work? I have better days than others, um, but it is it is crucial to well. First of all, I, I'm very uh, routine oriented in that um, my I know that I work the best in the morning. So everybody in my house knows that I'm going to be working starting at 8 a.m. in the morning. Um, there's no sitting around watching a couple TV shows and then deciding I'll start at 10:30 or something. I already because if I do that, I know I've already missed my most important hours of the day. So I'm always uh, at it at eight in the morning. And then um, to the best uh, of, of my ability, I will turn off distractions. And I think we all know at this point what those distractions might be, whether it's your phone or, or uh, you know, in the Facebook window open on your computer or whatever. Um, I try to turn those off when I really need to dig, you know, it's, it's amazing what you can get accomplished in three hours. If you just focus on one thing, <laughs> whereas you can probably um, get more done in three hours with no distractions than you can in eight hours with little distractions. So I just try to, to um, give myself a chance actually every day to accomplish what I need to accomplish um, rather than, um, sort of self-destruct by allowing other things to seep in. Um, and for me, I mean, composing is almost like meditating. It's, it's just like trying to get into that zone. Um, and it's such a great place to be if you can get into that zone. It just kind of gives you energy for the rest of the day. So that's, it's, I'm almost selfish in that regard and that I just want to get into that zone. It's all, it's a, it's a need I have. I'm addicted to it. I think my students are going to think I told you to say all of these things. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. It, it, it's so true. You know that if you really take the time to understand how you work best and you develop a routine that works for you and figure out, you know, what uh, you respond to the best. I agree with you on this uninterrupted focus. This is really excellent. Yeah. And it's amazing. Like how I, I'm actually surprised what, sort of uh, um, how much time I end up actually having to do other things. Um, because just like everybody else, I, I love to watch TV or go to movies or uh, for the adults who might be listening, you know, have a glass of wine at dinner, blah, 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 uh, go out with friends. And if I really focus during the day, I can then just turn my brain off and enjoy those other things that are so important in life as well. You know, going on vacation, you know, if I make us, if I make myself a deadline that I have to get this done before I go on vacation, then vacation is so enjoyable. I don't have to think about my work. So, um, like I said earlier, it's all, uh, it's very selfish of me and, and, you know, I, I force myself and, and enjoy that zone that I can get into 
so that that allows me to have the free time later. And people wonder how I write music as fast as I do. Um, uh, again, it sort of surprises me because I have more free time than I think I do oftentimes. It's just, but it's all about um, discipline and, and uh, prior, prioritizing our work over our fun. Yes, I had Denise Tryon on the show a few weeks ago, and she gave the advice of paying yourself first. So she has this thing she tells her students to do 55 minutes and out. So to just get in the practice room first thing in the morning and get it started. And then you can, you know, have the rest of the day and dedicate time to other activities. Jim, I'm enjoying everything about this conversation. How about a round of rapid fire questions before we wrap up? Okay, do I have to prepare for this? Let me think. All right, I'm ready. <laughs> so okay. for the people who are dreaming of a career that maybe resemble yours, can you tell us a little bit about what your life looks like? You already gave us a little bit of, of an idea of your work ethic, but... Yeah, uh, you might... Uh, on a daily basis, you would, as I said, you would see me sitting at my desk uh, writing music pretty much from 8 until 4 or 5 uh, and then it's a very normal life after that with dinner and, and time with family and things like that, going to kids' recitals and whatever. Uh, the other business part of my life is I do quite a bit of um, college residencies uh, or uh, conducting jobs uh, and or attending um, world premieres and performances and sort of acting as a consultant in those regards. Um, so I do travel quite a bit. Uh, there's several months coming up in the spring where I know that I won't even really be home for more than a couple days at a time. Um, so that's why I'm really busy composing music right now because I know my spring is going to be rather uh, difficult with travel. I don't write very well on the road. So you might see me uh, conducting. You might see me, as I said, uh, I love doing college residencies. This is something that I've recently kind of discovered and just the opportunity to work with um, and high school kids too, just working with young people who are discovering this love and passion for music. It is so addicting to me. I love interacting with this, these people. So uh, that is something I try to gear my career towards more and more uh, as well as composing for top notch professional orchestras and bands as well. So, that's that's my life in a nutshell, I would say. I, I left out the family personal stuff, but you can all assume that I do what other families do as far as vacation and time with kids and things like that. Mm -hmm. And I love what you said about this planning, having performances coming up, therefore you get a lot of work done now. So this recurring theme of, of planning comes back again and again with all the guests. I think that sometimes people think that you know, I'll practice when I have time, but that's not how it works. It's quite the opposite, actually. It's plan the practice ahead, and then the rest of the life happens. Yeah, and I mean, I think you know this too. Uh, we all have to learn our own routines and what and our life um, priorities and cycles, if you will, the rhythms we all work in. I, I had to learn that I don't write music very well on the road. Um, I can't sit in a hotel and be creative. So this in turn has informed me enough to, I know now that I have to write the music when I'm home so that when I'm on the road, I do other, cause when I'm at a college or at a, with an orchestra, I mean, I'm full on with the people I'm working for at that point. So, uh, my, my head is all towards the job that I'm there doing. So composing and, and that don't really go together. And I mean, I'm looking at my list right now. I have about 12 pieces that are due in the next six months. So this is what I have to do while I'm home. Otherwise, they won't get done and I'll make people very mad at me. <laughs> <laughs> and no, nobody likes to have people mad at them. Jim, is there a performance that stayed with you throughout the years? Oh, my gosh. Um I assume you mean you don't mean a performance of my music, uh, something I might have been a part of. That... No, it could be a performance of your music. Um, I'll name three things that come to mind. Um, the first two have nothing to do with me being a composer uh, or involved as a composer, I should say. Uh, I was at Tanglewood as a young trumpet player, and um, Copeland and Bernstein were on stage together doing Copeland's Third Symphony. Um, 
I wasn't a composer at that point, but kind of witnessing those two musical giants in the same place at the same time was really, really incredible. Wow. That was amazing. Um, and then uh, I remember, this is going to sound silly, but I was in Boston. No, well, maybe it won't sound silly, but it's very specific. Uh, I was listening to the Boston Symphony. Uh, this is when I was a student at New England Conservatory, and they were doing Mahler's Second Symphony. And there's a spot where they had decided, it's in the final movement. I um, can't remember if it's B flat minor or B minor. Anyway, the, um, the choir, it arrives at this big moment and the I'm singing a trumpet part, so that's what I used to do. But the choir all stood exactly at the same time. And I'm still getting chills thinking about, it. you know, it's like 150 people. And somehow they had been trained to stand exactly at the same time at this moment. And I tell you, I'm, getting sh I'm shivering right now thinking about it. I had chills just for so long. I'll never forget that moment. And my kids know that uh, Mahler 2 always makes me cry at the end. So that, that's, a, that's a big one. Um, something I hope to do as a composer someday to, to give other people that feeling. Um, and then I think the third one was um, kind of my first big piece as a composer, uh, large scale piece was my first trumpet concerto. And uh, boy, these all have a Boston tie. Uh, I flew to Boston um, from Florida at that point. And um, it was just one of those situations where uh, the soloist for whom I wrote it, uh, Jeff Work, now principal trumpet out in Oregon. Uh, he was a longtime friend of mine. I wrote a really difficult piece for him that he just knocked out of the park. Uh, the orchestra was great. The conductor was great. And the audience loved it and the reviewers loved it. And it was kind of my first big moment as a composer. And so that those sort of things kind of give us courage to, to keep going on and on. But, um, I mean, there are several moments, but those are, the, those are the three that kind of pop into my head. And the second movement of that concerto is the theme song for the podcast. Oh, my gosh, you're right. I, yes, that's right. So the funny story about that, I know we're probably running out of time, but that second movement was an add-on. That was never supposed to be there. Uh, I was originally asked to write uh, kind of a 15-minute piece, and, and Jeff, the soloist, wanted it to end he wanted the music to end kind of with a question mark and be very mystical and, and, and not your typical trumpet ending. You know, we all think of fanfares when we think of a trumpet and, and I love the ending of the first movement of the concerto. I, I'm really proud of what I did, but when I got done with it, I just thought to myself, you know, this piece needs like a Tchaikovsky violin concerto <laughs> last movement. You know, I, I need something to really show off what this soloist can do. Cause Jeff, the trumpet player, he's just fantastic. He can play anything you write. So that's how that second movement got born. It was really just an add on. And now it's uh, now here we are. It's on your podcast. Yeah. So. And I remember, I go. remember the first time I listened to it is shortly after, um, Holly was talking so much about you and I went on your website and you had a link to a YouTube performance of this and this movement started and I just loved it so much. There was something about the interaction of the strings with the trumpet that just really spoke to me. Awesome. Yeah. That, and that video, that YouTube is me conducting Jeff. So again, life, um, life continues in these meaningful ways. I finally got to conduct one of my very good friends playing my music, which was a highlight of my life as well. I'm so glad that resonated with you. We composers never know what people are going to like and what they're not going to like. And so to hear you say that a piece that wasn't even written for your instrument, really, uh, a trumpet concerto, uh, that you enjoyed it. So mm. thank you. I appreciate it. Thank that. you. What skills do you think young musicians studying today should acquire in addition to learning to play their instruments? I don't want to sound cliche, but you can't really overestimate people skills <laughs> for sure. Um, just being able to, to work with people and collaborate and choose words that aren't offensive. And, and I mean, we're all musicians. Uh, we are very stubborn and, and can be headstrong, but we also have to work as a team. So uh, that's important. Um, something we didn't know as a kid that uh, when I was a kid, at least uh, we didn't know that we'd have to learn how to also become marketers of ourselves um 
this is sort of something I've had to learn and, and, and business skills. Um, we, again, when I went to college, I never dreamed that I would have to learn how to speak of myself in a business sense or in a marketing sense and, and think about how I appeared publicly. Uh, we all thought, yeah, hey, you just practice your notes and things will take care of themselves. You get a job and, and the rest is history. You get your paycheck and make music. It's all great. Right. But there's so many, right? Yeah. I mean, there's so many other things, even down to just learning how to speak on stage about the music you're going to play um, and how you look, you know, and whether your pants are frumpy and if your shirt is ironed and your hair, you know, all these things they have in a, I hate to say it because I remember when people said this to me when I was young, I said, oh, be quiet. It's all about the music. Um, yes, it's mostly about the music, but our body language and, and the words we use to speak and convey our message to audiences, these all leave an impression. And there could be just one person in that audience that might really move your career forward. And uh, you never know when that's going to be. So if you can be prepared with all these other things in mind uh, as well, it, it can help. Um, and it can also hurt. So yeah. just something to consider. Oh, I agree with everything you just said. I mean, even just the way you walk on stage and the way you engage the audience as you walk on, if you smile at them and establish a connection with them, it, I feel like it makes the whole performance different for them. It's, it's so true. I was at a, uh, I keep talking about yesterday, I was at a recital because uh, my daughter was singing and um, it was high school students. And uh, there was one student um, who sang. And then at the very end, when she was done singing and the pianist was sort of finishing the little tag at the end, that's when she smiled because she was done. <laughs> it, just, it made such an impression. It's like, why couldn't you smile the whole time? You know, it would have it changed the whole performance so much. But instead, we got the sense of, oh, phew, it's over. Now I'm happy. <laughs> You know? <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's hard to do. I remember walking on stage and you're thinking about so many things you're nervous about one lick or, you know, this a high note, if you're a trumpet player, like I was, um, you're, you're, that's what you're thinking about. And an audience can tell if you're not thinking about, you know, the entire performance as a whole from the moment you walk on stage. It's so true what you say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They, they feel like they're in good hands or they feel nervous. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. It's so true. Jim, do you have a favorite book that you would recommend to our listeners? And it does not have to be a music book. I don't really have a favorite book. I don't get enough chance to read. I'm always, I'm always either, um, you know, writing my own music or, you know, maybe I'm, I'm reading about other people's music or reading a biography of a composer or something. Um, But I treat books differently than I think most people. When I read a book, I'm really intrigued by how authors write the book rather than the book itself. Because mm -hmm. I, I, I think of composing like an author would think of a book. I'm always thinking of character development and, and what when a book gets boring, I think, oh, why is this boring right now? And, you know, I, I read books differently than other people because I'm... I'm inspired by authors uh, to figure out how I can write my music in the same way they might write a book. It's really, really interesting. Yeah, I mean, this, the, the real short story, the short answer is any book, well, most books I read, I, I really love. And, and so I can't really, it's like when you're in an orchestra, right? You, you play Strauss and you're like, oh, there's no better composer in the world. And then the next week you're playing Brahms. And oh my gosh, this is the best composer ever. And then you play Mozart and you say, oh, of course, Mozart is the most famous and the best. I mean, every, everybody has something to say, their own unique voice. So I usually just kind of get, if I am reading, I get totally into it at the moment. And then when I'm done with it, I, if I happen to start reading another book, I get engrossed in that one and that becomes my favorite. So it's the same thing with movies too. They all become my favorite while I'm watching it. And then when I'm done, I get back to work doing something else. <laughs> so it's... That's great. Here's that's presence for you right there. <laughs> What about a piece of advice that you've received and that you would like to pass on to our listeners? Um, okay, so when I was when I was 14, I was um, 
uh, lucky enough to win the, I, I think I said earlier, I went to Interlochen for high school. So it was at Interlochen Arts Academy and I had just showed up for school and I was very lucky I won the concerto competition. I was playing the, the Hummel trumpet concerto. And I'll never forget, um, my trumpet teacher was in the audience and he listened to the dress rehearsal. This is gonna sound so basic, but it, these things just happen, they happen to us at various points in our lives. Uh, he was at the rehearsal and he came up to me quietly at the end of the uh, rehearsal. I still remember exactly where I was standing on stage. And he said, Jim, you know, it's okay to make music once in a while. And it just happened to be at the moment he said it, I was like, oh my gosh, you're right. It doesn't matter if we just get the notes, we can actually say something about the music we're playing. Mm. And this is something I'm trying to, something I'm trying to convey uh, to this chamber orchestra I'm now conducting. It's like, we have this luxury, this gift to be able to be in the present and make music for that moment. Every rehearsal, every performance is different and music is so special that way. So it's okay to just convey what we're feeling at that moment and put it into the music. And hopefully it takes the music somewhere where it hasn't gone before. And so I would just encourage uh, others to, to um, get outside that box a little bit and, and express more than they think they should. Again, going back to, to showing our own personalities. Uh, and then something I have to say this, this is a very basic thing. Uh, it's again, going back to me being a trumpet player, I once crashed and burned on stage, crashed and burned. And uh, I was doing a, a different concerto somewhere. And somebody came up to me afterward and, and uh, said, nice job. And I proceeded to go, oh my gosh, it was so awful. I did terribly. I ruined this. I blew this. I couldn't get the high note. I, you know, my lips were dry. And so I couldn't get a lot of notes out. And, and he looked at me and he just said, Jim, just say thank you. <laughs> here, I gave, here, here I gave you a compliment and you totally ruined this conversation. You took it and made it all about yourself. And just, I gave you a compliment. Just say thank you. And, um, this transfers also to a, a lot of times nowadays I'm, I'm, um, I do interviews like we're doing now, or people will send me emails and, um, they'll ask me a lot of questions. They'll interview me through emails and I'll spend a lot of time. I'll invest myself and, and send them responses. And I pour my heart into it and I never hear from them again. Mm. And it would mean, it would mean so much if they would just say, thank you. I know I'm an old fuddy duddy in that regard, but it goes so, it just makes a difference. So if somebody gives you a compliment or if somebody does work for you and spends time, please just say, thank you, mm. please. Yeah. <laughs> Not you, Renee, but I'm just, <laughs> just nice I'll you. send you some chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good. That'd be awesome. But you know, I want to say, I yeah. love your first answer so much. I love the second one too, but oh, this first one is a keeper. It is so true. So true. Oh, about making music. You mean that in the moment? Yes. I, I'm going to challenge yeah. myself and, and everyone around me to think this way in the coming days and the rest of my life, maybe, hopefully. <laughs> well, yeah, we have to remember what got us into this business in the first place. And it's usually we were sitting in a concert hall or hearing something on the radio and somebody did something that grabbed us. You know, it's that, it's that unexplainable, that thing we can't define that somebody did through their instrument or with their voice or, or just something they, they transferred across the airwaves or from stage to audience and it hit us. And so now we have to be the vehicle. We have to do that ourselves. We have to go the extra mile so that we might reach somebody else in our own unique way. Yes. Well, these two tips are really great, but do you have another one, a quick actionable tip li that the listeners could implement today in their musical lives? Don't be afraid to practice slowly. <laughs> <laughs> so, <Thank> so, <laughs> my students will please really practice think, slowly yeah my students will think i paid you to say those things uh okay i'll say for the record she did not pay me to say these things this is the first time we've talked in this interview so, uh, <laughs> scenario so jim I know because I follow you on social media. And by the way, I hope everybody starts following you because your 
posts and your presence is so engaging and entertaining. And so I know there's a lot of really exciting things happening for you right now. I'd love for the listeners to hear about them. You want to talk to us a little bit about that? Sure. Um, this is, uh, for me, uh, our, our composing lives kind of go in cycles. We have various projects that sort of come all at once. And um, this is kind of an orchestral year for me. Uh, I write for all sorts of things, bands, uh, choirs, soloists, um, what have you. But uh, this is a big orchestra year. Uh, the the uh, biggest, at least personally, because I mentioned earlier how my dream was to someday be um, a trumpet player in the Chicago Symphony. Uh, that dream is being realized not as a trumpet player, but as a composer. I'm having my first world premiere with the Chicago Symphony um, in June of 2019. And I just delivered the score last week to Ricardo Muti, uh, who will be conducting. And I actually got to sit in his office with him for about 30 minutes. And it was a really surreal experience to have him looking at my score page by page. He didn't just glance. He really was like studying it there on the spot. Um, nodding at times, uh, saying Bene, which I think meant that he liked it. Um, and just, and then he would start telling stories about his musical life and just, it was, it was great. So the dream of being involved with the Chicago symphony is now going to happen in June. And I'm really excited. It's a bass trombone concerto for Charlie Vernon. Uh, and, uh, and then that, uh, I have a few others, uh, writing a piece for the quad city symphony, uh, which will premiere in April which will be a multimedia piece uh, where I'm using spoken word and video and, and other things, uh, multimedia things, pictures and paintings, all interacting with a musical score that I am writing. I'm also writing my third symphony, which will be premiering in April uh, down in Miami. My first two symphonies are for band. So this symphony being for orchestra is fun for me because that's how I grew up as an orchestral musician. And then I'm also writing a chamber music piece for the River Oaks Chamber Orchestra down in Houston. Uh, and they are, um, they've commissioned like 80 new pieces. They're, they're very active in the new, new music world. So I'm glad to be included in, on their program. So that's what I'm doing over the next six months are those big four orchestral works. Wow. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, in addition to some other things, but uh, that that's that's what I'm doing. Hope to see you all yeah. there. <laughs> Is it, isn't it funny how childhood dreams have a way to become reality when you listen to your instinct and you move forward? I just love that. Yeah, I I, I can't even I can't quantify or qualify. I can't. I don't know how it's all working out that I'm getting a piece played by Chicago Symphony, but I couldn't be more thrilled. Uh, I grew up, as I said, listening to their recordings almost daily. And I'm from Chicago originally, so I went to hear them all the time. And so to now be the one who gets to write the music that they will, that will be on their music stands, uh, it's kind of, as I said, surreal to me. I'm, I'm not going to take it lightly. I'm not going to take any of it for granted. I feel very lucky. Mm. Jim, thank you so much for being here today. You've been so generous with your time and your story is absolutely inspiring and your message is such an important one to hear. Again, I'm so grateful that your music, which I love, greets my guests every week. Thank you so much. Absolute pleasure, Renee. Thank you for your thought-provoking questions for your time as well. And, and congratulations on this wonderful podcast that you're running. I'm I think you're inspiring and a, a very joyful person to spend time with. So thank you. I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank you guys so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this chat with composer Jim Stevenson. Let me know what your favorite takeaway from today's show is by joining the conversation on social media. I'd love to hear about what inspired you, what specific questions you have about mindful practice, and what other topics and guests you would like to hear about in future episodes. I am Mind Over Finger on all platforms. If you're looking for a community of mindful practice enthusiasts, join the Mind Over Finger tribe at facebook.com slash groups slash Mind Over Finger tribe. 
There you will find inspiration, motivation, and support, as well as information and discussion on how to take your practice to the next level and enjoy the process. Next week, I'll be discussing hands-on creation and music making with bass player Kavi Rastagar, member of the band Knee Body, and currently on tour with singer John Legend. And now, something a little different. So, my kids have been fascinated by the concept of a podcast, and they've asked me to be on the show since the beginning. During the holiday break, after their piano practice, they saw my recording equipment set up and asked me to record an interview with them. I did it to make them happy, but then they made me promise to include it in the next episode. So, here I am, fulfilling a mother's promise, and I introduce you, Aiden and Evelyn. I hope you'll enjoy their unprompted, candid answers to my questions. It certainly made me smile and laugh. Hi, so I have two friends with me today. I think you guys are my number one fan, even though maybe... I'm not sure you've listened to one episode of the podcast, but that's okay. You're still my number one fans, right? Yes. What's your name? My name is Evelyn, and I am six years old. And what about you? My name is Aiden, and I am eight years old. Tell me, Evelyn, do you play an instrument? I play the piano, and I've always wished to playing the violin like my mom. Oh, that's good. What about you, Aiden? I play piano, too, and I also dream of playing the violin like my mom. Mm. And who's your piano teacher? Our mom. Oh. Our mom. Is she nice? Yes. Yeah. All the time or most of the time? Most of the time. Most. <laughs> and although our mom is the host of these podcasters, that's right. <laughs> that's right. Hey, so Aiden, tell me. What do you think mindful practice is? Mindful practice is never giving up. The only real limit to your practice is quitting. <laughs> you always work hard and keep trying and trying again. Take it like a grizzly bear trying to fish. Er, lots of times it fails to catch a fish. But soon a fish flies right out of the water and catches it in his mouth. That's pretty good. That's you a good did it. You did You did your goal. And you can always keep trying on what your goal is. Because if you quit at what you're trying to do, you'll never know if you might have succeeded in the future. That's good. What about you, Evie? What do you think mindful practice I is? I think mindful practice is that you practice a lot and you... You think of what it might be about and how it is and if you like it or not. And if it's some things that you don't like and some things that you do. Mindful practice is something that brings people together. So and what, wait, what, what do we do when we practice mindfully? We practice this calm and relaxed. Calm, oh, yeah, calm and relaxed. What about sometimes when we'll take just like one measure and we do it many times? And you need lots of dedication. Yeah. What else do we do? Well, we work hard and try our best. And if we don't do it, just keep trying until you think it's, well, good enough. Or if you think you don't want to do it anymore. Yeah, that's pretty good. And that, not doing it anymore, would be quitting. And we don't <sighs> want to quit during mindful practice. We want to keep trying until we get it. Yeah, I like this attitude. Yeah, really much. You know, when I started doing piano and I started doing it with two fingers at the same time, I was doing this song called Sleep Little Baby and I thought it was going to be really hard. I kept trying and trying until now I'm past that piano lesson and now I'm on to way higher ones. Yeah. And is this because we practiced mindfully? We went slowly. Did, did we practice each hand separately? Yeah, so, like, if we play two at a time, there's one above and below. So first we practice the ones above, which is the main course melody. And then we have 
the bottom part that I don't know about, but that's like that's the like, rich tone part. That's the accompaniment that makes the sound of the melody stronger and stronger. That's what the accompaniment, the left hand in the song, is for to strengthen the bonds of the song. So we practice. We, we did like little chunks, and we did it faster and faster. And now you can play the pieces. Does that feel great when you can play the piece? Yeah, we practice well. And my last concert, I didn't get a note wrong. That's pretty good. Yeah. All right. What would you like to tell the listener? What's a good piece of advice you would like to tell the listener? Well, you you people gotta keep practicing and keep doing what you love and want to be when you grow up. Oh, that's really great. What about you, Wayden? Work hard. Give dedication. I mean, dedication. Never give up, and always believe in yourself, and show integrity. <laughs> That's great. You know, my guest this week on the podcast was a composer. Do you guys sometimes like compose music? Do you guys improvise? You do yes, that. Yeah, you do. Yeah, yeah. Evie, what yeah. happens in your head when you're improvising? Well, what I do is that I just think. Look at the notes and hear their sounds, and then when I make music, I hear that. Well, that doesn't really sound like a real song, but it does sound like a pretty one. Like, I don't need to make it real, like Twinkle Twinkle Little Star or Jingle Bells or anything like that. So you just you hear things and you. Try it on the keyboard and you see if it sounds good. I just play a note. I feel like if that's the right sound, then I play the next one. And maybe that's the right sound and that's the thing that I want to start with. So I keep pressing notes and feeling like, huh, that's a pretty sound, huh? I don't want to use that. <laughs> that's pretty good. How about you, Aiden? What happens when you improvise? When I improvise, it feels like I'm making my own song up. Or I'm just making... A song that's already made even better and better and better. <laughs> that's oh, good. that's a lie. Yeah. But it doesn't matter if there's a lie. Yeah, that's right. One more reminder. Don't quit if you like to do it. Because you really want to do it and you got to keep doing it. All right. Thank you guys for being here today. And there you have it. Don't forget to keep trying and trying like a grizzly bear. You can find the show notes for this episode and more information about Jim at mindoverfinger.com. If you enjoyed this episode, please take a minute to head over to iTunes to rate and leave a review. It's very much appreciated. Again, thank you and à bientôt.